All right. Welcome to another episode of The Christian Sages. With me, Jason Kiefer, the E-Tard, and Doug Inman. Say hi, Doug. Hi. Hi. I'm Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I spent, like, all afternoon trying to figure out WordPress and getting very frustrated and um, using some choice words that were not G-rated. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Yeah, you know, God will forgive. You're Catholic, right? I mean, I it have, doesn't yeah. matter anyway. I just got to say five Hail Marys and a few Our Fathers, and we're good. We're good, right? I'm not even a Catholic. I, you know, I say Hail Marys every now and then just in case. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got rosary beads just in case, you know, <laughs> there's ever a demon that comes in the house and I need to do an exorcism, you know. We, we don't have very strong faith. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we can, um, anyway, so we are going to be discussing Malachi, the <laughs> Italian prophet, uh, the yeah. very last book of the Old Testament, which is kind of interesting, you know, that this is the, the very last book, because you kind of like, this is the most important thing that we want you to take into the next covenant right here, just remember this. It's kind of the way I get it, like, you know, it's kind of what I feel about it like you know this is important because it's the very last thing that the israelites are going to hear from the holy spirit for 300 years yeah and it's interesting because it's really depressing but then there's also <laughs> hope right at the end That's like right. and you don't know if it's really hope or if it's going to be something bad so it's kind of interesting well it's definitely i think that it's definitely showing it talks a lot about the heart yeah. and i think you know that's kind of what the Holy Spirit wants to get across in this, you know, what our, our heart attitude towards the Holy Spirit, our heart attitude towards the God, what we, towards God, what we think about God and what we think about his character. It's really what a lot of this covers is what our heart attitude is towards the Holy Spirit and how we react to our life around us and the slow progression from being somebody who is really on fire for the, I mean, it's kind of the way I would, if you'd liken it onto how we react today. It's like the slow progression from someone who's on fire for the Holy Spirit to someone who's compromised so much that they're actually living in sin. Right. But, but they don't realize they're living in sin. And I think that's what's so well, sad and shocking about this is that they don't realize what they're doing. Well, the thing is, yeah, um, the thing is God's fully aware of our heart attitude. And I think that's what, what you're, you know, you kind of see in all these books. But when they start questioning God's love for them, it's interesting how this book set up with God saying, you said this, but I've done this, and you've said this. But when you start questioning God's love or doubting his faithfulness, yeah. you start to push him away. Absolutely. And then you start to really, okay, do you even have faith? Because faith is believing God for who he is and who he has revealed himself to be in his word. So we can never question his character, but that's what these people are doing here. And that's what sin, that's the effect sin has on us, is that it, it causes us to have a, a wrong view of God. And then we're yeah. really in dangerous ground because he's not that's he's right. not somebody to trifle with. You know? Well, I think it's even more than that because what they do is then, when you have a wrong perspective on the character of God, you begin to justify your own sin. Yeah. You begin to justify your reactions to to God and your reactions to the world. It's, it's kind of like saying, oh, well, um, I'm divorced, so therefore it's okay for me to uh, look at porn because I haven't had sex in 13 years. You know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't justify. Whatever happened to you doesn't justify sin. Right. But, but what, what, what the Israelites, you can see they're <laughs> doing is they're allowing this gradual attitude in their heart towards the Holy Spirit to affect their actions. But it's affected right. them at such a slow rate that, that when God comes in and says, hey, you're doing this and this is wrong, and they look at God and say, what are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about? How right. have we wronged you? How have we done things that are wrong? It's like 
this slow progression of then when they finally are confronted with what they've done wrong. Like he goes over and over again, like, well, you've done this and you've done that. You've, you've offered sacrifices that are blind. You've offered um, sacrifices that are lame. And you know that's not acceptable. And particularly when you have, you know, male, perfectly healthy animals and you're offering me the lame and the sick, you're offering me secondhand offerings. Even goes on to say well, that, they... you know, you're, you're robbing from me because you're not even bringing the tithe into the storehouse. And when he gives them all of that, their response to him pretty much is, well, we don't really trust you. And that's why we're not doing this because, right. you know, and, and, our, and, and it's an attack against the character of God, because the reality of it is, is that 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 attitude in their heart of giving God second best is, is a result, a reaction to the fact that they don't really trust the Holy Spirit and that they don't really trust God and they don't really trust the love that he has for them. They even go on to say, uh, where he says, you know, you said harsh things about me. And they're like, what are you talking about, God? Well, we, you, what do we mean? We've said harsh things about me. And he says, well, you, uh, let me see if I can find the actual verse here. Uh, now the priest commandments. It's 314, I think. Yeah. He also oh, says that in, he also says it in 217. He says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, in what way have we wearied him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? And he goes on again to say that in, in, in uh, 13, where he says, um, you know, you have said, your words have been harsh against me. In 1313, 13, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinances and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed for those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. So it's a direct attack on his character right there by saying, this is why, you know, you're saying, you know, how, how are we, how are we doing this? You know, what are we doing? What are we saying against you, God? And he's showing them what they're saying. And they're like, yeah, that's because we don't really believe that serving you is going to produce anything. Let's bring it right down to right. it. That the, right. wicked, the wicked are prospering, but we're not. The, you know, the, the injustice is rising and therefore you're not a God of justice. So why should we bring you our best? Because the reality of it is, is that you're not worthy of our best because that attitude is snuck into their heart. That's what they right. start believing. It was just, well, they start out, it starts out with him reminded them, I have loved you. And the yeah, thing is, true. we are a lot like the Israelites here where we need to be reminded of God's love because we're often thinking God's love is measured by how good things are going in my life. Yeah. And so what we're doing there is we're trying to mold God into our image and, and whatever God we want to serve. And he's not going to, he doesn't going to, he's not going to bend or bow to us. So we say, why hasn't God given me this or that or my dream job or this? And if our plans don't turn out the way they think they should, and that's what the Israelites are saying here, look, look at the Edomites, they're getting everything, they're getting blessing. And he's like, no, but I have loved you. Right. And so, and the thing is, you think about you think about love. The greatest motivational factor in this life, which is really the primary uh, fruit of our faith, is love. It is it, it's really the mark of a true Christian, like Jesus said. That's how you're going to identify as my disciples that you love one another. But it motivates us in everything we do, primarily in our relationship to God. And you look at what God did for us. He yeah. sent his son to die, which is the greatest. Talk about show me. Show me you love yeah. me. Yeah. Well, there's the greatest expression of love. And so love is the motivation for God. And then when we become his children, it becomes a motivation real fact for us. Yeah. So here you go. And, and you look at them saying, well, how have you loved us? And right. he's like, well, have I not shown you? Have I not been consistent? Have I not been faithful? Yep, that's right. And they're basically saying, no, because you haven't given us what you want, what we want. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that slow progression of hard attitude where you're attacking God's character and where, you know, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's something that we have to realize about Israel, too, right. that this wasn't something that happened overnight in Israel. This was a right. slow progression of where the enemy or where the circumstances, disappointments, um, where the enemy comes in and hammers those things home in their heart, where it's a slow progression in their hard attitude, in their lack of trust for God. It wasn't like they woke up one day and said, you know what, God, we're going to say these harsh things about you. Because in essence, what they're saying is, God, that there's no point in serving God because there's no reward in serving God. That God isn't right. going to take care of you. That God isn't going to do anything for you. That in the end, you're going to be disappointed. So what's the point? 
Well, yeah, he's right. God, and he's my God, so we still got to offer up sacrifices to him. But what we're going to give him really isn't isn't our best. We're not going to bring right. a tithe into our storehouses. We're not going to bring any. We're not going to bring our best uh, uh, choice lambs anymore. We're going to give him the blind and the lame and the stuff that we didn't want anyway. And we're just going to give that to God as our offering. And that's offensive to the Holy Spirit. Because, but because when you really trust somebody and when you really know they love you and when you really trust God and you know that he loves you, then you want to give him the best. Right. And, and that's what the problem is here. That's what you're seeing in Israel and is, is this. They're not giving him their best anymore. They're, they're just like, well, yeah. we're we're called to to love them with all our heart, all our soul, mind and strength. And you think about true love is like true repentance. It's like true faith that touches the heart and soul and it moves the will of the person to yeah. action. So yeah. we're and we're required to love God with more than just our mind and intellectual assent. Yeah. You know, and that even um, and the thing is with the offense is when you realize how great an offense your sin is to a holy God, really the only appropriate response is to be broken like David. And it's such a great offense that sin is so so bad that that's why Jesus had to be sent and tortured and beaten. And we, we often yeah. forget about that, even though we hear it all the time, we forget about that. And That's so, right. but the thing is, once you realize how great your sin is, then you can really realize how great his grace is. Yeah. Because when we just, if we've just forgot about it, I've heard a pastor say, you know, we weren't born with amnesia. It's just not a normal thing. Right. And God designed that for a reason so that all your sins, you, yeah, you, you know, he's like, I heard somebody pray wipe all these sins away, wash them out of my memory. And he's like, God's not going to do that because you're going to remember how far he had to reach to save you. That's right. And you're going to remember how great he is. Yeah. And so that's the whole thing here. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the lesson is really like um, sin doesn't really care. You talked about last time about the sincerity of our heart. Yeah. And sin doesn't care about the sincerity of our heart. It doesn't care about the good things we've done. It's a killer, and it's the greatest killer of all time. That it is. And so that's why God takes this so seriously. No, I agree. I think it sin has always been a symptom of a heart issue. That right. that that's what sin is. Sin is not a sin in itself is not the problem. It is the reason sin is a result, it is the symptom of a heart issue. And the heart right. issue is what Jesus Christ died on a cross to settle. Is that heart issue? When He settles that heart issue, then the result that the when your heart has been healed and your heart has been settled, and and you've been set free in that area in your nature, then then your actions change and you stop sinning. And right. and so what we're seeing here is a direct correlation of that in 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 these scriptures is that. Uh, what God is telling Israel is that look at your hard attitude towards me and look at what the result of that hard attitude is. And he goes on. I mean, if you read the whole, we could read over and over again what they're talking about here, where he says, well, a man robbed God, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even in this whole nation. Bring all the tribes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there is not room enough for you to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of the ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all the nations will call you blessed, for, for you will be the delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. But he tells them right there, you're robbing me. And they're like, well, how do we rob you? Every, and you can see that throughout this whole thing. You have a heart problem, and this is the result. You're robbing me. Well, what do you mean we're robbing you? You know, he starts it out by saying, don't you know I love you? Right there is the base heart problem. You don't know that I love you. And you don't believe that I love you. And then he goes on to right. show them where, you know, what are the results of that heart problem. And the results of that heart problem is they're robbing God. That's just one of them. Um, he says another one that, um, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way for me. Will the Lord of hosts whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of the coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer the Lord an offering of righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near for you judgment. 
I will be swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage, earners, and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away the alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? Again, he's giving them a list of things that they can do, of things that they have always done. And then they say, well, how have we turned, how can, you know, how have we turned away from you? You know, it's like, how shall right. we return? In what way shall we return to you? In other words, the way they see it is that they don't need to return to God. He's right. giving them all of these things that he's done in the past, all of these things that, that he will continue to do for them if they seek his face to show his love for them. And if they would just turn their hearts back to him and they say, well, how, what are you talking about? In what way well, shall think, we return? You know, uh, yeah, I think the big, the big thing here is that you get a sense of these people have forgotten who God is and they don't even absolutely, care. Absolutely. And so just like Hebrews 11, uh, 6 says that for with faith it's impossible to please them because you draw near to God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe he is, that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Yep. Yep. And so... And that's just it. I think they're, that our theology, and I'm saying us, the Israelites, and then even today, our theology is way off because we forget that God is so great that if you see him, you'll die. True. He's just that great. And so nothing else compares with him. And I think that often we you see these shirts like, you know, Jesus is my homeboy and stuff like that. I can't stand that. But we have this pathetic picture of Jesus, you know, that's painted by a lot of preachers who are like, oh, well, he's breaking for you to come to him. And it's like, no, read the Bible. It says he's got fire in his eyes, a sword coming out of his mouth, and he judges, and he's coming to judge and make war, and he's going to crush you and break you. And so you better seek his mercy. He's not He's not someone to play around with. And so here's the thing with these, the Israelites here, they're, um, you know, he's saying, you honor your father, but where is my honor? And, and really what he's saying is you have no fear of me. There's no fear. The love of God and the fear of God are related. And so when one truly loves and fears and reverences God, uh, you reverence God and you obey God. Like we talked about with uh, Joel last time. You're, yeah. You will express true repentance in obedience. You will express true love in actions. And they're clearly not seeing this. And I think it's a, it's... Uh, a hard issue, like you said, it's a theological issue. It, it's really touching on everything. Oh, it's definitely. I think it's showing the state of Israel before. And then he goes on at the very end. He talks about really the coming of John the Baptist and the coming of the Messiah, that these are the only fixes for what's going on in Israel. But I think there's yeah. no, you know, this is the attitude Israel has. And this is the attitude of their heart and God. And I think that's why one of the reasons why it took 300 years for the Messiah to come and for God to again speak in Israel because this is their heart attitude. Okay. Everything they're trying to do then becomes, you know, one of the things that happens when you step away in, in the heart and the spiritual and you stop trusting the Lord, you start trying to do everything yourself. You start trying to do everything in your own strength and in, and, 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 and in the flesh. And you see that in with the Maccabees and you see that with what had happened and, and nothing against the Maccabees. I mean, for their time period, I think they were great men. You know, they tried yeah. in, in their own understanding to to be men of God. But in reality, what you see is Israel tr and is trying to do things in their own strength. And you see that problem even, too, when it comes to Jesus and dealing with Judas, is that Judas was, was, was a zealot. Judas was expecting Jesus to rise up and take over the kingdom, and they were going to overthrow together the, the, um, the, the Romans. But instead, he's come to bring a spiritual kingdom he's come to to, right. to bring redemption uh for the lost he's come to bring salvation and he can't see that because he's so used to doing things in his own strength he doesn't trust that and right. i think you still st you still see that in a lot of israel and even in their leaders which is why jesus has is such a hard time against them is this lack of trust in god where they have begun to trust their own understanding and then they begin to make the dictates of god what they understand from their own understanding and we do that all the time
It's like, God, I don't trust you, so I'm going to do this myself. And I, you know, I know from personal experience when it comes to tithing or when it comes to certain issues in my life, oh, I can't pay my bills. So my natural response is not to go to the Lord and give more. My natural response is to find more hours at work, to get a second job. And those things are good. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things. But when they become your go-to, that shows where your heart attitude is towards your trust for right. the Holy Spirit. Same thing with sickness. Well, when our first response is not to pray, not to seek God, not to believe for healing, but to go to the medicine cabinet, and that's our first response, it shows where our heart attitude is. That doesn't mean that medicine is bad or that we shouldn't right. take medicine. But when our first response is to go to those things, well, that's a problem. That shows a heart well, problem. Exactly. That's the problem with in James four, where he talks about don't boast about tomorrow and don't make plans as if you're going to go into the city and do business. He's not saying that we should never make plans like, hey, Jay, you know, Saturday, let's do this or that. What he's saying is it's, it's a whole heart attitude as if right. you don't need God, as if you're, you're going to live in a way that God doesn't even exist. You're practically an atheist when you do that yeah. because you're going to do. Just like you're, like you said, not that these things are bad, but that's our first attitude. That's right. You know, and it, it all stems from the heart. And here's the thing too: is is I haven't studied it enough yet, but with the tide thing, a lot of people will say, one, a lot of people point to this as proof of tithe. But I think if you're going to talk about tithes, you got to go back to like there were three tithes, I think, uh, ceremony, civil, and you got the moral tithe which which pre-existed the mosaic law right where abraham tithed to melchizedek yeah. melchizedek yeah and so melchizedek. i think they're melchizedek, melchizedek yeah um, so i think it's interesting though because you and i have talked about this before where where you know tithing 10 percent is like is is like preached from most every pulpit yeah um you know, and and, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, we, you know, we type ten percent. I think it's a good, um, sort of a good mark. You know, but sure, um, it, it's not it's not really commanded. But you've you've mentioned it before, where it's like a principle. Yes. But I, I actually think that that's um, there is a case for it though, because oh, it absolutely. goes all the way back to Genesis fourteen. What it shows is your heart attitude. I actually wrote a blog post about this where the little foxes spoil the blind, the vine, and it's the little hard attitudes that creep up on you that show where your heart is. The little, you know what I'm saying? The little, the little actions you make, like, oh, I'm not paying my tithe this week because I can't pay my bills. And that's not something that you would normally do. We're not talking right. about you're in a situation where you're absolutely destitute and you really can't pay your, you don't have any money anyway, and you didn't make any money, or, you, you know, it's just this one time you struggle. But we're talking about if every week you're starting to have these issues in your heart, where you're starting to see, like, say I'm a, I'm a, I am a tither, but then all of a sudden I don't, I don't trust the Lord anymore, and I stop my, I stop tithing. You know, I can, I can justify it all I want and be like, well, I'm just going through financial issues right now, and when I'm done going through financial issues, I'll start tithing again. But what that shows is that little deviation of lack of trust with the Holy Spirit is producing a reaction. It's a, it's, it's a sign of something right. greater going on in my heart. What maybe something happened and. Um, you know, I paid my tithe and I felt like in my heart, God didn't provide, you know, you know what I'm saying? Or, or, yeah. uh, they shut the electric off and, uh, what, and I had to go without electric for a day or two, you know? And so you feel you allowed, you allowed the enemy to come in and plant a seed in your heart that says, God doesn't take care of you in this situation. God didn't take care of you. So that little heart attitude begins to breed and then it will start to produce an action. And then all of a sudden. I didn't pay my tithe this week. Why? Because I wanted to pay my electric instead. But this is not an attitude that you've normally struggled with. You see what I'm saying? We're not talking about right. someone who doesn't understand tithe as a baby Christian, who's new at this, who doesn't give, or someone who never really gave and never really tithed. We're talking about someone who, like Israel, who was serving the Lord, who was doing things right. Well, something came in and produced an attitude where they stopped trusting the Lord, and they started to doubt God's character. And that produced well, you know, an action, um, which is they stopped paying the tithe. They stopped giving God 100%. They stopped giving God sacrifices that, that, that were the best, that cost them. Well, there's, yeah, it, th there's also with uh, the love of money being the root of all evil. Sure. Um, what you're doing is, is 
what does the world say is ultimate power, money, the money is power, you know. So yeah. we're taking what the world is saying. This is this is the greatest value you could have. And we're giving it away. Yeah. And I don't know of a better way to basically make a statement or to fight Absolutely. off the love of this world, the love of the money, Absolutely. grabbing your heart than to give regularly. Absolutely. Oh, I agree 100%. Yeah. It does show your heart. Because God doesn't, let's be honest, God doesn't need my money. Right. God doesn't need my money. This is a result of you saying, God, I trust you enough that I'm going to give 10% and trust you. That I'm gonna, you know, that I'm gonna trust what you ask me to do because I know that, like the promise is, is that He would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot receive and, well, or, or that it's you like, cannot contain. It's like all His laws, really, is is His laws. We look at it like, why do I have to do this or that at times? And really, His laws, uh, like we learned in Ecclesiastes, they're like, they're like a fence. They fence us into to this pasture, and He says, this is what's appropriate. This is what's good for you. And sometimes we want to look on the other side of that fence. Yeah. And everything he does, just like you said, it, it develops this trust in you. And he's saying, it's much more important. Your comfort is much less important to me than um, trust and then a true relationship with me, which is eternal, by the way. You know, and, true. and we, we have such a myopic view of everything. That's very you true. Know, what, what, instant gratification now and why do i have to give this money to you know yeah and so anyway but it truly yeah, we is don't, hard, we don't think uh, about the eternal perspective on it you know right. the, the fact that if i give now that he's going to pour out the windows of heaven we only see the immediate response to it oh i don't have this money right now and i might need this money right now but yet you're not seeing the you're not seeing the response that God is going to have to that, which is I'm going to pour out the windows of heaven. And in the end, it's kind of like the the five loaves and two fish. Well, the kid had enough money to feed him had had enough food to feed himself, but yet he gave it to Jesus. And and what he got back in return, you know, when he gave it to Jesus, he knew he wasn't going to get he wasn't giving it thinking, oh, I'm not I'm going to get it back. He was giving it thinking, well, I'm not going to eat now. But right. he asked for food, and I have food. And he gave it to Jesus, and, and they're like, that's really not enough. And, 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 and according to the world, it's not enough. <laughs> but yet when he gave it to Jesus, Jesus took, said, that's enough. In my hands, it's more than enough. Not only did he feed the 5,000, but the kid took 12 baskets back with him. You see what I'm saying? Right. He, if, if he had only looked at what he had, if he had only looked at what he was giving up and not the response that God was going to have to that sacrifice— then he never would have given it up because he, and that's, again, when you doubt God's character, you are only looking at what you have to offer and the sacrifice you're giving up, not the response God is going to have. Why? Because you don't trust the response of God. You're saying, right. I don't believe you're going to respond to me and give me 12 baskets full. Let's be well, honest. Can... We've all wrestled with this in our life. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no. Well, I was going to say, um, Talking about trust in what he's going to do, when you look at uh, chapter 3, verse 14, it's in vain that we serve God. What is the profit of keeping in charge or walking in mourning before God the host? Evildoers, um, and, and now we will call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to test and they escape. Yeah. And so yep. on the surface, the good and the bad get the same thing and the bad get away with it. Yep. Like we talked about in Ecclesiastes. Right. And here's what we forget in verse 17 through 18. We forget that we get to know God. Come what may, we get to know God and he is our portion. Yep. And they have to face his judgment. We forget that we must look at things, like you said, eternally. We must look at things eternally and see that we have God's hand of mercy upon us. And his, his hand of, of wrath is on the wicked. And so when we really see things, we should be very content in all, all circumstances. Paul talked about it all the time because he had true faith and he saw the eternal picture, you know, in, in every circumstance. So, yeah, well, I mean, I, when you look, the, what you just read um, where is where is in 13, where it starts, 13, 13 or 313. And the one, the scripture right before it is the one on tithe. And, yeah. and he's saying, you don't, you don't pay my tithe, and this is why you're not paying the tithe. Because you don't really believe that if, I, if you give the tithe, that I'm going to pour out the windows of heaven and, and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Because if you really believe that, you'd pay the tithe. And again, it comes right back to that attitudes that we allow into our hearts. I mean, if we're going to look at this as a practical application for our daily lives, 
and then we have to come to we have to really look at ourselves and admit to ourselves where we're doing this because I know I had to do this. There there was a point in time when uh, after the divorce where I didn't trust the Lord anymore. I was angry. I felt like I had done everything right and it didn't work out for me. And I didn't. I, I stopped seeing all of the things that God had done for me, all the things God was continuing to do for me, and I got focused on the one thing that he didn't do, and that changed my perspective. I started to doubt his character, and that produced little heart attitudes. That produced little things like, well, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. Or I'll do yeah. it, but I'll only do it when I can, when I have time. You know, I'll go to church, but I'll only go to church when I have time. I'm, I'm going to stop going to all the special services. Why? Because I need time for myself. That's how you justify it, right? Oh, I'm hurting, and I need time for myself. But in reality, it was a pulling back away from the Holy Spirit because I didn't trust him anymore. I didn't trust him to take care of me anymore because I had gotten hurt. And that took my eyes off of all of the things he was doing, all the things he was doing in me, how he walked through it with me, how he healed my heart, how he took care of my finances, how he had continued to do that, even when I had bad heart attitudes, because he's God yeah. and he loves me. But it got me so focused on just the one thing he didn't do. And, and I've had this happen, and I'm going to be honest, because I think this is how we apply it to ourselves. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I've had that happen other times in my life where I felt like God didn't do something and I had put time and effort and I had done things in my mind right and God didn't do it for me. And I got yeah. discouraged and it was like, well, God ain't going to take care of me, so why should I try? So you stop tithing and you only give every now and then or when you have excess instead of giving out of the need, instead of getting consistency consistently, you stop going to church as much as you used to go to church. You stop getting involved in the services the way that you used to get involved in the services. You stop having your own personal prayer life the way that you used to have your own personal prayer life. And you begin to pull back. And we see that our relationship with God is very much like our relationship with people. Because when we have a break in faith with people, we do the same kinds of things. You know what I'm saying? We, we, yeah. we gradually begin to pull away. We gradually begin to give less of ourselves or not our best anymore to that person. Let's say of our time or, or whatever. You know, let's say you just used to give a lot of time to that person. And now you don't. You only give a little bit of time. You only give that little bit of time that's left over after you've done what you want to do. When you used to give half of your time. You see what I'm saying? And we do that to God. And that's what we're seeing here with Israel. And I think that's what we need to take away from this as Christians, to be careful to see those attitudes in our heart where disappointment, where the enemy coming in and attacking God's character and us beginning to believe that lie about God's character that gets our eyes off of all the things that God is doing and only gets them onto and, and amplifies the one small thing he might not have done that then produces this hard attitude where we begin to pull back from the Holy Spirit and stop offering our best best. Stop making him first in our lives and start giving him the leftovers of our life. And I think all Christians can say we're guilty of that. We're guilty right. of giving God the leftovers of our time, the leftovers of our money, the leftovers of our heart instead of, yeah. instead of the first fruits. And that's what the ties, sorry, let me finish my point. Let me talk. That's what the ties signifies is the first fruits. It's the first. It's not about how much it's about the first. You know what I'm saying? You're giving God the very first, <clears throat> the very best. And we stop doing that when we stop when we stop trusting God's character. We start believing lies about God. And we allow that into our heart. And we stop believing that he loves us. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Um, if, you, uh, if you look at it, so, so we read this. Yeah. And we see we've, we've profaned we're, his honor. We've profaned his covenant. We've profaned this and that. So the proper response is, of course, return to me, yeah. and I will have mercy on you. And then I think there's a key part here in uh, chapter 2, verses right. 10 through 16. He talks about the covenant. <clears throat> one thing he talks about is, is, is the covenant of one father. Do you not all have one father? God created us. And I think what he's talking about there is created Jacob, where he says, I created you, O Israel, or whatever in the Psalms. Right. So why then are you faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Right. And here's the thing. Once we've repented, once we've turned back to God, once we are to walk, how, how are we then to walk? And I think identity is very, very important. And the covenant is really how God has revealed himself. And the thing is, oftentimes we look at it like, well, um, you know, he's talking to Israel here as if as if 
we aren't the people of God. And then you turn and you, you look at the whole story of redemption. It has everything to do with God calling and forming yeah. the people for himself. And so we are Christians because God loves us, had mercy on us, and has called us as a chosen people. And so you look at First um, Peter 2.9. And he uses like Old Testament type language here, but he says, you are a chosen generation. And he's talking to us, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Yeah. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's right. So we are the people of God. And that's our identity. And I think once you have repented, once you return, yeah. how, then should we, how then should we live? Well, we should live with the identity that we are God's people. Absolutely. And that he has called us. And if you're going to walk, how are we going to walk in a manner that, that is consistent with him? Is to yeah. walk in a manner that's consistent with his character. And so it's a relationship that we get to know him more and more. It's yeah. a growing thing. Look, that's that's what I talked about um, this past Sunday. We were talking at Sunday school about, about love <clears throat> and how love is a living thing, kind of like faith is a living thing. Yeah. It's not just something dead. You don't just say, you know, your wife says, show me you love me. So you say, well, I bought you a ring and a, and a house, you know, nine years ago. Well, that's not going to do. Maybe those were acts of love, but then it just died off. You know, and he's getting yeah. into uh, uh, the covenant, the marriage covenant here. But the thing is, faith and love with God are the same thing. It's a consistent <laughs> thing. It's not, hey, I said a prayer a long time ago, and now I got my ticket into heaven. It's, it, you know, and, and too that's often right. we've, we, it, American evangel. Uh, evangelicals it's like this easy believism that we've promoted where god's love is cheap his grace is cheap just come grab it get it and you always have it and it's not that right it's a love that it that lives day by day that's faith right. day that's by right. day and that's what they have forgotten because they forgot their identity anyway i I'm well i, I let think you talk here you know i think too <laughs> i think too that um it's interesting that you talk about how they do hit on the marriage covenant in this. That's one of the things he talks about, how you've left the wife of your youth. And I don't think right. he's referring to, he's using that as an example to say how we've left God. But, but you can see that in relationship. When you're, you've, you're married, I've been married, you know, um, been married a long time. You understand that relationships take work. And what, it's not, what causes adultery and a break in a marriage doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you right. wake up one day and you just don't love your wife, you just don't love your husband. This is this is a slow progression where you start pulling away from each other. Whether and and you can almost always see how one person has or there's there's a break in trust with each other and they begin to pull right. away from each other. They begin to doubt each other's character and therefore that changes their response to one another. And right. that and then they start seeing things from a different perspective and they stop giving their hundred percent. <clears throat> they stop giving a hundred percent to each other, and that produces this. Eventually, produces adultery or 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 well, that, or a, or divorce, and and you see that. And you talked about how this is a book. He talks about fathers returning to sons. Well, the reality of it is, is that we can't change our heart attitude by ourselves. That we need to come back to the Holy Spirit. That we need to. And he says at the very end, the very last thing that he says is, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will return the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And he talks about himself as the father. And am I not the father? Am I not your father? Am I not a father? And I believe that this is about, and this is why he's talk, it's a prophecy about a lot, about John the Baptist. But what he's saying here is, He's going to come and he's going to restore that relationship between me and you. That's what he's going to bring. He's going to restore that relationship. The heart of the, the and the hearts of the father are going to is going to turn back to the hearts of the children. The children are going to turn back to the hearts of the father, and then we're going to restore that relationship. And and right. you know that's that's where the hope comes in here is that you don't have to stay in this. When you realize this has happened to you, you don't got to stay there. That God has an answer, and that's to turn your heart back to the father. It's well, to you turn know, your heart back to, to God and allow God and allow that relationship to be healed. And then those attitudes, all of the things that you've been doing will change. It's like, I don't know how to give my tithe anymore. Well, look, deal with the attitudes in your heart that are causing that problem. Deal with that, that break in relationship with God that is causing that problem. And then you will see the change in your actions. It's like we always want to deal with the sin action and hope that that changes our heart. 
But it's the change in heart that changes the sin action because the sin action isn't the disease. That's the symptom of the disease. The heart attitude is the disease. So you can't change the disease by just treating the symptom. You know, in medic medicine, you can't, you, if somebody has cancer and it's a curable cancer, you're not going to cure that cancer by just cure, by just treating symptoms. You've got to go to the root of the problem and cure the cancer. Even if curing the cancer makes the body sick for a period of time, you know, makes yeah. the symptoms worse. Well, it's the same here. If you've got an attitude, if you, if you see that there's sin in your life, well, you need to go to that hard attitude and see what's producing that. I didn't, you know, it was hard for me. I had a friend once, um, Jen actually had talked to me about how I needed to go back and see why I had, why I was responding to certain things poorly. And, uh, it was dealing with sin in certain areas. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to go back. God, that's ridiculous, you know, but it made sense to me when I really thought about it, that going back to that attitude in my heart that produced this break in my relationship with God that caused me to walk down a path of sin was the only way that I was going to deal with that sin because that was what was producing the sin. The action in itself, right. just dealing, trying to deal with the action wasn't really going to stop anything because that attitude in my heart was still there that produced that sin. Right. So going That's... back and dealing with that is the only way. Dealing with the root is the only way you're ever going to stop that sin. And God's trying to tell them that here by coming back to me, your father, coming back to me, and building that relationship and dealing with the issue to be, that had started this to begin with is the only way that you're going to be able to progress forward <coughs> and progress out of that sin. Go ahead, what were you going to say? Right, that's why he says um, to guard yourselves, guard your spirit, oh, and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. And it's interesting, he says that this is one of the reasons for marriage, or one of the top reasons, he says, for godly offspring. Because the thing about God is if you remember in Exodus 34, 6 through 7, where he says he's slow to anger, the great self-revelation. But he doesn't just say, I'll just love you, because God's so much greater than just me. He's just so much greater than just you. He says, I'll love a thousand generations, because God's desire is not just to bless and love just one. He wants everything. He wants them all. And so that's our job, it's, or that's what the marriage covenant's about. It's about God. And it's not just oh, to absolutely. produce offspring, it's to produce godly offspring. And so I've always found it fascinating that, um, this is a little off topic, or it's on the marriage thing, but the whole Catholic thing, you know. It, and so if God created marriage in the garden prior to the fall, they, the thing is, it, it's really weird for, for the whole Catholic thing and the celibacy and the priesthood, and we've seen what happens from that. But right. the thing is, if... If it was actually wor if it's better or more holy to be celibate, then right. why wouldn't God have said it's it's good that you are alone? But He says it's not good for you to be alone. That's right. And then He gives him Eve, and He says it, it, He doesn't say, "Don't touch her." He says, "No, multiply. You know, be fruitful and multiply." And He says the same thing here: godly offspring yeah. is what He is seeking. And so I found that interesting. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think you know. The whole being celibate, too, is just another way of trying to deal with sin in our own strength by locking yeah, yeah. yourself away, by cutting your, trying to cut yourself off. And you're, you're going to deal with the hard attitudes that are producing the sin in your life by just cutting your cutting it off completely. And again, I do believe that they're like, Joseph, you need to run away and not put yourself like if you struggle with lust, don't go to strip clubs. You know what I'm saying? Don't put yourself in situations where you're gonna you're gonna be around that. Uh, Good you know. advice, yeah. Jason. I mean, if you're if you're an alcoholic, <laughs> don't go to the bar. You know what I'm saying? I do agree with that. I don't know but... why I keep falling. <laughs> I keep showing up at this place. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> what? I can't go to the like, strip clubs and not sin. What? Well, like, you know, it's like there there's nobody ever just falls out of nowhere for no, sin. When you absolutely. fall, you fall down a path that you're walking. It's a yeah. slow progression. It's it's that old adage that, you know, one deviation point when you go down the road a mile is huge. When it starts, and even for the first half a mile, it doesn't look like much. But as it farther along it goes, the farther away from the right path it is. I've and, learned that lesson in golf a lot. <laughs> yes. Yes, that definitely applies to golf. That definitely broken windows. Golf. Broken right. heads. Yes. Well, that's all we, that's all the time we got today. Uh, I did want to end it that, and I wanted to, I'm going to digress into potty humor here. Oh. Um, 
this is the only book where the Bible talks about God throwing poop on people. He says <laughs> in chapter 2, uh, verse 1, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you, if you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces, the refuse <laughs> of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. So in I other words, you, you know, the poop you God's... your feasts, I'm going to rub it on your face. Yeah, I told you God's judgment was fierce. It is. It is. I mean, hey, that's a pretty bad feast there. I mean, that's... But I, I couldn't not that hint on that because of too repent. much of like a six-year-old. There's no way I could not mention that. There's just no way. Yeah. Well, if... if yeah, if that would make me repent. <laughs> that would make me <laughs> repent, too. Be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a poop at you. If you do not repent right now, <laughs> I'm going to hurl some crap at you. I'm going to do that right now. But God is not a, you know, God is not a monkey. But still, it's uh, <laughs> be like, that's the evidence of evolution. God throws poop uh, like monkey. No, anyway. Well, it's interesting but, that you said before that our righteousness is filthy rags. So they're oh, like yeah. Yeah, yeah, man yeah. diaper. They are. So that, they are. So he's going to rub our righteousness right in our faces is, is sort of what this is saying. <laughs> I like that. That is what he's doing. He's rubbing his righteousness in our face. Now, I couldn't get away with not mentioning it. I'm sorry. There was just no way. Anyway, th hopefully you enjoyed this tonight, this discussion on Malachi. Um, you can catch us at, you can contact us at thechristiansage at gmail.com. The website is actually up. It is on WordPress. It is not done, but you can check it out somewhat. I have a test um, podcast or blog up there from my old blog. I'm going to be moving everything over to that once I can figure out how to use it and not have to use bad language while trying to operate it. Um, but it currently, I'm having a hard time with it, and it's taking me a lot longer to get it all up and running the way I want it to. But you can check it out at the Christian Sage dot, um, at the Christian Sages, plural, the Christian Sages dot WordPress dot com. You can check out our site there. Uh, as always, you can go to Podbean and pick us up on Podbean at the Christian, and we are the Christian Sage on Podbean. Um, and hopefully, we'll have a YouTube channel up, and we'll have some more blogs up for you. I'm going to be uploading Doug's as soon as he gets it to me from uh, ones that we've written in the past. Anyway, hopefully, you have a great night. Um, oh, there's also a place on there for prayer requests. I haven't figured out how to make it work yet, but once I do, you'll be able to go up there and put up some prayer requests, and that way. We can pray for you guys, and you can also pray for each other. And I figured it'd be a great place to kind of develop some community here. Anyway, if you want to, if you want to contact us, just contact us there at those places. You have a wonderful night. God bless, and we love you. Good night. Good night, and good luck.